the video. <laughs> just just video. in case, okay. So we just want to reinforce the match. Thanks so much. Anna, whenever you want to get started, we can we, we have access to the to the slides here. Yeah. And while I'm uh, setting up the equipment, I um, want to thank you guys for those of you who voted on the format of the class. As I mentioned in the beginning of the semester, the idea is for us to adapt um, given the circumstances. And we wanted to take advantage of the presence, of the physical presence of our speakers here. And it looks like you guys appreciate it, have more time to interact with our speakers. And today we have two of them here, uh, our main speaker and uh, my commentator that I'm going to introduce them briefly. And, but I, uh, in a way, I appreciate the fact that you guys enjoy this opportunity to spend more time with our speakers here. I think it's a great opportunity and should take advantage of. I know we don't see the video here, but I'm just assuming that you're playing it. The meeting is being recorded now. For you, and uh, have what? Have you played the video already? No, I can do that. Okay, so let's play the video, and then I'll get back to this yes. PowerPoint. Hopefully by the end of the semester, we'll figure things out. So <laughs> bear with us. No, no, we don't hear the sound. Series of lectures are part of the political, social, and economic development in Brazil course offered by the School of International Public Affairs with support from the Institute of Latin American Studies and the Lehman Center for Brazilian Studies at Columbia University. Over the years, we have had speakers from a broad range of areas, including leading academics, current and former senior government officials, representatives of international organizations, and Wall Street analysts, among other distinguished guests. Even though the discussions are tailored to graduate students in international affairs, public policy, and Latin American studies, the lectures should be accessible to anyone interested in Brazil. Following a tradition set forth by Professor Albert Fischlow, who launched the Brazil Seminar almost 20 years ago, we aim to continue offering a unique academic experience to students while enabling the participation of the community now with the use of new technologies. Thanks for joining us and enjoy the session. Anna, and uh, we can get back to slides now, and we properly start the class. Hi, I'm television's know. Alex Moffat. You know, in New York, nothing is guaranteed. Is that a There's parking spot? Who knows? <laughs> well, now your Grubhub has a guarantee. Get your part of our class. The lowest price Here's and inappropriate. Thank you. So let's get to the slides. <laughs> so for our uh, internal audience here, and for those of you who are following us, um youtube okay, welcome again this is the brazil seminar directly from columbia university in new york city today we have uh some special participants and uh, the topic is most pressing i would say that one of the most visible items in the public policy agenda on a global scale 
gender policies have been at the forefront of policy agenda for quite some time, but not, not until recently, this has been a topic that has received the, the attention that uh, really deserves. Uh, I think uh, we've been talking about, hearing about gender issues, the importance, and everybody acknowledged the, the, how much it impacts development. And at the same time, I would say that uh, we, because of our biases, because of our uh, the way that uh, issues are framed on a global agenda, uh, until, not until recently, gender hasn't been part of the priorities that uh, uh, at both at the national and international uh, discussion levels. And I, I, I actually I have to acknowledge the fact that uh, when I was preparing this class, in fact, I was thinking about my own biases. And to be totally open with you, this is the first time that we have a session that uh, that is completely devoted talking about this particular topic and i think it's also a reflection of how we frame uh, even though we acknowledge the importance we we know that uh, how in, uh, impactful they are uh, sometimes we don't uh, we, we we don't prioritize them as much as as we should right? so it's my great pleasure to introduce you our speaker today a great friend and um, one of the foremost specialists uh, that have devoted a substantial part of her career uh, to as an advocate and specialist on gender issues. So Paula Tavares is a senior legal and gender specialist from the World Bank. And she's been working at institutions uh, for uh, more than a decade, uh, devoting her career to international development and comparative analysis, focusing on gender equality, women's economic inclusion, and, and uh, most of, as I said, like, uh, and also on private sector development. As I mentioned, like she works for the World Banks, uh, in particular on women, business and law, currently focusing on promoting gender informed policy making, improving the legal framework, protecting women from discrimination and gender based violence and enhancing women's economic opportunities. Paul is fluent in English, French, Portuguese, and Spanish, and has extensive experience in Latin America and Sub-Saharan Africa, where she has spent a, a lot of her time because of the work that she does at the bank, working in advocacy aimed at implementing changes on the ground through capacity building, knowledge exchange, and community-driven development. Paula is from Brazil, a Brazilian lawyer, holds an LLM from uh, in international law from Georgetown, and, and a specialization in international relations from the University of Brasilia. And she also has a faculty appointment at American University, where uh, her teaching focuses on gender and policy. And as a discussant today, we are very pleased to welcome Professor Camila Daniel, who is spending the semester here as a visiting professor. She comes from Rio de Janeiro. And uh, it's a pleasure to have Camila joining us for a quick discussion. All right. So, without further ado, let me hand over the podium to Paula. And Paula, thank you so much for being with us, coming all the way from DC and heading to New York. Great to have you in the classroom. It's, uh, it's my pleasure. And uh, thank you all for, for having me. Um, I'm very happy to get the invitation from Sydney, especially given uh, the awareness that. Uh, there has been the focus on gender and the, the relevance that gender has taken and the fact that this had been something that um, was also asked to be included. And so it really does show, um, as you mentioned, and as I've seen through my work, how there's been increasing focus um, and awareness on the importance of looking at gender issues and promoting gender equality and understanding where the gaps lie the huge gaps that still remain and how to drive gender equality through law policy um, and interventions. As Cindy mentioned, I've been working on these issues for over 10 years with the World Bank and in different regions, um, looking at discrimination uh, first from the legal perspective and women's rights, but also working on and supporting governments and policy making and working on uh, supporting 
also uh, civil society organizations. Um, so kind of looking at it from different perspectives, including the private sector um, and how to drive gender equality in different levels, um, both at the government level, but also um, in business and, and, and through uh, society as well. So it's just really a kind of holistic approach. And what I'll do here is focus um, a little bit on the work that we've been doing with some of the evidence that we've seen um, from World Bank work and other analysis that have uh, have emerged um, showing uh, the relevance of gaps, the impacts, and also some of the policies that uh, have been recognized as helping drive gender equality, um, which I think is the focus here, and specifically looking at Brazil um, for, um, for the purpose of, of the seminar. But, looking at it from a little bit of a comparative uh, basis as well, and especially where Brazil has made progress, but where it can also learn from other countries that have um, adopted policies that have been effective and Brazil can still um, kind of improve. So next slide. Anna, can you move us? So first of all, I mean, this is a recognition that I think is now pretty um, widely uh, acknowledged is that gender equality is definitely an intrinsic, has an intrinsic value in itself. Um, it's part of the human rights agenda. It's, uh, uh, it's a goal in and of itself, but it's not only a social and moral imperative, it's also essential for economic growth and development. It's been recognized internationally that no country or economy can really achieve its potential without fully uh, integrating women and girls, and while critical gaps remain between women and girls and boys. We understand that women in the world and in most countries are either half or more than half of the population, but they lag behind in many of these areas in social, economic, and political empowerment, and that has repercussions. Next slide. Wait, wait. Can you can you everyone uh, hear it? Uh, Paula, can you hear me? Back? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Maybe. Um, some of the some of the um, analysis that has been done, and, and this is just helpful, and we'll go through a little bit more of this, is that investing in women is smart economics, and that's not just economic growth. Um, but it's really smart for economies and for development. So increased women's economic empowerment and increased gender equality has been linked by analysis and evidence to improve education and health outcomes, both for women, for children, but in general for society, to higher per capita income for economies and countries where greater gender equality exists, to faster and more inclusive economic growth um, all around, and for greater competitiveness, right? So these are kind of some of the key areas where we can see um, impacts in terms of gender equality. Next. Next time, please. Anna, can you move next? Some of the, um, just the costs that have been um, acknowledged, and there are many others, but these are some of the analysis that are, are very commonly known. Um, McKinsey uh, did a study about uh, in 2015 showing that closing gaps in female labor force participation, which are currently lower than men's, could uh, yield up to $28 trillion in global GDP, that's about 26% of global GDP, equivalent to the GDP of the US and China together. Um, and that would be if we closed all gaps, right? The analysis, if you look it up, um, it kind of has uh, measurements between 12 trillion and 28 trillion, and 20, 28 trillion depending on the, the level of, of closing gaps. In Brazil, the same analysis was done and the impact would be 3.3% of GDP for closing gaps by 2025. Similarly, um, another study was done if the labor force participation gaps were reduced by 25%, by 2025, there could be a 1.5 trillion increase in global tax revenue, especially impacting emerging and developed countries. The World Bank did some analysis looking at the um, wealth and the, the, the loss for countries in human capital wealth because of differences in lifetime earnings. So that is directly correlated to the gender wage gap, um, but not just the gender wage gap as it's assessed 
currently, but looking at the impacts of women's lower income and lower um, basically earnings throughout their lifetime because of also constraints to accessing labor markets, uh, lower constraints to education, health, and, and other um, quantifiable measures. So again, um, a really large amount that could be reached by the global economy if we were to close these gaps. Next. Also important impacts on development. And these are some of the uh, evidence that uh, have been found from, from studies in different areas uh, beyond just the economic costs. We know that educational attainment for women are associated with lower fertility rates, having a positive effect on growth. Um, and also conversely, of course, gender inequality undermines, um, uh, gender inequality education undermines growth. Looking at the impacts of increased female education and literacy on child mortality, education impacts as well. Also the impacts of women's political participation, which is quite interesting, connected to, of course, democratic outcomes, but also increased investment in some of the issues that promote welfare for all, such as social services, more equal legislative frameworks, also associated with increased schooling for girls, central women's health. Um, so all of these, as you can note, are things that translate into better outcomes overall for the economy and faster development. Next slide. I also bring this, I mean, this is more focusing on the private sector, but there's been also a lot of analysis looking at impacts to businesses. Um, and I don't have to go through all of these, but basically, um, you know, showing that gender diversity, and this is not just gender equality, some of these studies look at gender diversity more broadly um, and gender balance, but of course, you know, linked to environmental, social and governance standards, um, greater profitability for countries, higher market growth, and really increased returns uh, for venture, uh, equity and venture capital funds. So there've been a number of, of analysis done and these can be found um, by different institutions and really showing the impacts also on the private sector, which is a bit of the economic case um, that has been driving um, some of the interest, of course. Um, so I think it's it's important to point out. Next slide. And here, where we stand a little bit, this is at a global level. Um, and there are, of course, many other measures that we could bring. Um, and But these are some of the key ones looking at women's political, economic, and social participation, um, looking at you know, women making up about half the population, but really generating only 37% of GDP because of um, lower participation in the, in the labor market and the lack of, you know, the kind of the, the productivity from women that is, is that fails to contribute to economies. Political representation, really that's one of the lowest ones. This is on average 25.5% globally. That's on national parliaments, so women in congresses um, around the world. Women's labor force participation about 26.5% lower than, than men's. The global gender wage gap estimated at 23%, meaning that women overall and in average earn about 77 cents for every dollar that men earn. Um, and this is generally tied to uh, performing the same work or work at the same value, right? So this is kind of looking at that perspective. An impact um, that is important to, to pull out, which is one of the underlying barriers as well, is the fact that women spend three times more hours on unpaid care work. So this is work at home, working or caring for children, which has an, a cost as well, estimated at about 13% of global GDP. If we were to calculate this and consider this work and productive work, which it is, um, but which it isn't accounted for, and it takes that away from, from women to do productive work. And of course, looking at you know private sector and, and leadership in the private sector, ability, women's very low participation in higher levels of decision making. Um, the global gender gap currently at 32%. This is the assessment done by the women's, uh, the World Economic Forum, and this is the, the, the global gender gap report that is put out every year. This is the 2021, um, and there's actually been, uh, you know, an impact from COVID, so it, the gender gap has increased. Um, and currently, this is the projection that at current rates, it would take 135.6 years to close the gender gap in the areas measured by the report. Next slide. And we'll look at Brazil a little bit, which has very similar um, gaps uh, in some areas of doing a little bit better than globally and others doing a little bit worse. The overall gender gap at 31%, so pretty similar to the global gender gap. 
in terms of earnings about the same, a little bit more of a gap than, than globally, um, earning about 30% less than men. In terms of political participation, one of the lowest levels um, around the world, really, women currently representing about 15.2% members of Congress. Participation rate as well, 54% of women participate in the workforce versus 74% of men. I take care of work also impacting women's time and the amount of time they have to work and to do productive work. And in leadership positions in the private sector, um, a very small minority of women uh, represented. Next slide. This is also um, analysis from McKinsey. This is from the same report, and this was looking at trends and how we've evolved in the last five years, and this was 2014 to 2019, but really not much progress. Um, and I won't go through all of these, but uh, there's been either very little progress or none at all. Um, the you know, outliers here, which are you know, kind of saying, you know, not all is, is lost, is really in terms of education and health. These have been the, the areas where the gaps have closed um, more significantly, both globally and in Brazil. This is global, um, but looking at, of course, maternal mortality that has dropped, education levels are about the same. But in other spheres, and this is looking at inclusion of the gaps, there's been very little progress, um, right? So that's concerning. Next. And then when looking at COVID, and this has been uh, really, uh, had really huge impact on the progress that had been made, even though slow, um, we had been seeing progress, which now um, the impacts have been showing that really, um, you know, we could go back you know, a generation in terms of progress made to women's uh, rights and gender equality. This is, these are just some quotes from, you know, UN Secretary General looking at, you know, some of the really the underlying reasons for why COVID has hit women harder. And these are the same reasons for why gender gaps continue to exist um, and some of the underlying barriers. But really these have been key areas of, of why impacts have been so large on losses to women's jobs and income, um, you know, lack of social protection in many cases, working in informal sectors much more so than men and really being burdened with unpaid care work, especially caring for children and with COVID, the children at home, that being really uh, a, a huge a huge impact to, to women and, and their capacity to, to work outside of them. Next slide. These are just some of the kind of key areas that have been researched from UN women really, but looking at you know the increase in poverty um, resulting from COVID and the top one is men before COVID and the projection. The bottom one is women before COVID and the projection, the number of women in poverty versus men living in poverty in 2030. Um, and this is uh, these are projections post-COVID. The losses in jobs by women um, and really uh, the number of women that have left the labor force, um, again, because of these underlying barriers. And of course, connected to the amount of unpaid care work that they do at home. In Brazil, um, these are recent figures showing that 8.5 million women have left the workforce in the third quarter of 2020, and really half the female population outside the labor market, a drop of 14% in female labor force participation in comparison to 2019. So really huge impacts um, from, from COVID. Next slide. And now, I mean, this is more recent, even now that the economies have started recovering and jobs, um, have started being regained. This has benefited women less, again, because of all these underlying factors, very similar, um, and constraints, especially connected to responsibilities at home, caring for children, but also lack of, of social protection. But looking at you know progress in labor force participation, 2012 to 2020, this is already looking at COVID. This is also looking at um, men and women with children and kind of without children. Then with children, with children under three. So the bottom line, which is the lowest one, is women with children under three. Um, and so the impact's really um, larger when, uh, for women and children, especially understanding that many of these women are single mothers and really having to take on double, triple shifts um, in, in care of work. Um, again, drop in unemployment, um, lower for, for, for women and for men. And again, uh, the only measure in Brazil, and this is looking at policies, right? The only measure that was adopted um, at a national level in Brazil during COVID was there was emergency aid that was provided to 
of people in certain situations, unemployed, et cetera. And there was a benefit that was granted in double for women who were um, in, the, were in the categories that were um, benefited by the emergency financial um, benefit and for single mothers. So that was some of the additional help that was. This is really looking at what are some of the constraints, and this comes from the World Development Report put out by the World Bank in 2012, and looking at what are some of the um, dynamics that play into gender equality, and it's looking at formal and informal institutions, markets, and households. So some of the things that um, I've discussed and we'll discuss, um, and looking at what are some of the areas of gender equality that uh, can be looked at. So endowments, which are really and some of the assets that go into this, so health, education, um, agency is women's capacity to make their decisions, to have autonomy, to uh, kind of, you know, act on their own and, and have independence. And this is um, also um, important, like the political participation and voice and economic opportunities in general. And this is interesting. This was the 2012 report focusing on gender with the World Bank for the first time. And we were discussing earlier how some of these, you know, because I know the focus on, on this work is, is relatively recent and even within the World Bank, when I started working on these issues back in 2010, there was very little work done on this and a lot of traction was gained um, around this time, not because of this report, although this contributed, but more recently with, you know, a lot of the visibility around these issues and, and trying to, to understand. So um, next. So really kind of some of the, the two key areas that um, we'll go into a little bit, but um, that kind of play into gender inequality today and that um, can be addressed through policy. So formal and informal barriers. So unequal laws, institutional practices, which still exist in many places around the world, in Brazil as well. Um, and the underlying social values and cultural norms. So what we know is even when you change laws, even when you grant equal rights, and even when you have oftentimes policies, you might not see change because of the underlying social values and practices that perpetuate um, the inequality that was there, right? So we see that in all spaces. Um, so what are some of the, the policies that can act to address these gaps? Next. So driving gender equality, what works? Um, we know that economic development and economic growth, growth to a certain degree um, can help gender equality, but it's not enough, right? And, and there have been analysis and evidence um, showing that you need an institutional environment to do policies that address it. We know that international mutual instruments and commitments by countries, including by Brazil, have helped promote the agenda, have helped drive a lot of the work that's been done by countries. I'll go into that for Brazil. Um, so we have the, the, uh, the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women that was uh, enacted, uh, came into effect in 1979. That was a big push for countries to start changing laws, removing discrimination and restrictions to women's rights and, and capacity. Um, the Beijing Platform for Action in 1985 provided really a framework for mainstreaming gender and commitments within countries for creating uh, institutional mechanisms um, and really driving the agenda within countries. And more recently, we have the Millennium, the Millennium Development Goals as well, but more recently the SDGs with very specific targets um, and a goal focusing on gender equality. Targeted laws, policies, interventions, really focusing on one hand on lowering barriers and leveling the playing fields, right? So eliminating discrimination that explicitly oftentimes still exists, but also uh, providing incentives and kind of support for women in areas that um, might not change or might not um, be conducive to, to changing easily. So next slide. So how do we stand on removing some of these obstacles? Next slide. This is just a little background on women's rights in Brazil, and I'll go through this very quickly, but it's just to show that, you know, even the recognition of equality and rights is very, very recent around the world and in Brazil. Um, in Brazil, you had women um, earn the right to vote in 1932. Um, many restrictions, especially connected to 
marriage and responsibilities at home, but also to rights um, for married women. Uh, it was only in 1964 that women could, for example, by law, um, get a job without their husband's permission, open a bank account without their husband's permission, um, do all sorts of uh, transactions outside the home um, without their husband's permission. It was only in 1988 with the new constitution that uh, formal recognition of equality of rights was granted in legislation. And it was only in 2002 with the new civil code that some of these formal discriminations um, really um, ceased to exist. For example, men were still formally head of household, which oftentimes can be connected to um, you know, some benefits, uh, public benefits, social security benefits, but it's also connected to, to several rights. Um, so next, again, this is just quickly what I already mentioned, but just kind of how progress happened leading the way, right? So a lot of feminist movements, and this was again, global, but also in Brazil in the late 1980s, um, the ratification of the convention I mentioned, its optional protocol, and really uh, a lot of a civil society movement within the country leading to the inclusion of this gender perspective in the 1988 constitution and for legal changes in law, as I mentioned, the civil code, for example, and a few others, really um, emphasizing the obligations and ensuring compliance with the constitutional principles. Thanks. Within the structure of government and some of the, uh, the progress that we've seen, um, the creation of the Secretariat for Women's Policies, this was 2003 initially, and similar institutions at the state level. And so the Secretariat um, really had this mandate um, from the beginning to promote policies within Brazil, focusing on gender. Um, there were many um, changes within the, the, the Secretariat. It was at, cer at a certain point it had the status of ministry since 2015. It was back to, to going to secretary. There's been a lot of um, kind of back and forth in a sense in terms of the priorities given to the agenda and the, the relevance that the, the institution has been able to, to have within creating policies for women, um, but really charged with mainstreaming the gender agenda and implementing really some of the mandates stemming out of the Beijing platform that I mentioned, right? All, all states have now uh, created similar institutions. So this is really um, you know, something that's spread out throughout Brazil with state and municipal level um, government bodies and agencies that are responsible for this agenda. And so that's part of the work and making sure that this is really reaching the local level. Um, commitment to addressing domestic violence. I mean, this was considered uh, you know, major progress for Brazil, especially it is still one of the key areas on the agenda in terms of, of achieving gender equality for Brazil and one of the key um, agendas for the Secretariat today um, as one of the, you know, the, the, the huge impacts of, of violence in Brazil. Um, and as I mentioned, as in most of the world, more progress in closing gaps in education and health. So that those have been some of the kind of some of the large achievements. Next. Next. So barriers and women. Now I'll talk a little bit about this is global. This is um, part of the analysis that we do at the World Bank. So looking at um, some of the constraints to women's economic inclusion, um, looking at legislation really, um, and how laws can impact women's economic participation. And so two thirds of countries around the world still improve laws affecting women's pay. And that's either through promoting affirmative um, policies or promoting equal pay for equal work provisions that don't exist, or for example, removing restrictions to women's work in certain sectors that in many countries um, still exist. So women can't work, for example, at night uh, or in certain industries that are often higher paying industries, right? So it's one, um, some of these areas. 30% of countries still restrict women's access to employment opportunities, um, similar to what I mentioned. Limiting rights within marriage and inter-household bargaining power. So really women lose rights oftentimes when they get married, such as I mentioned in the Brazilian civil code used to exist, that still exists in some countries. Um, and constraints to entrepreneurship, so as in access to property um, and assets, or even access to credit when um, trying to get loans to start a business, right? This is the WEO measure that only 10 countries have closed all these gaps. Um, these are specific areas that are looked at. So this is not, of course, the entire uh, legal framework, but this is uh, you know, an important part that looks at women's economic participation. Next. In Brazil, based on the same measure, um, some of the areas that uh, still 
um, kind of pose some constraints in K, for example, and I'll go into this. Um, there isn't uh, there isn't a policy looking uh, mandating equal pay for work of equal value. So again, conducive to the gender wage gap that we saw. In terms of parenthood, and those are laws and policies connected to supporting women's work after they have children. Um, so parental leave provisions, and I'll talk a little bit more about that, um, have been shown in some countries to provide more equal distribution of childcare responsibilities, and uh, there is no policy in Brazil around that. In terms of women's entrepreneurship um, laws that prohibit discrimination and access to credit, for example, um, do not exist in Brazil. And in terms of pension, this is something that um, is also looked at. It's the you know laws that really provide unequal retirement ages and unequal policies around women's retirement and pension and how that might impact women's income and even poverty after they retire because of less time contributing to social security and also oftentimes shorter careers and possibility of, of income increases. Next. And this is coupled with bias gender norms, right? So patriarchal practices um, in the home, at work, discrimination, violence against women and girls, unequal opportunities in the labor market. Again, uh, some many of the issues that I mentioned, right? Unequal division of unpaid care, domestic work, limited control over assets and property, and unequal participation in private and public decision making. So these are some of the key areas that result in unequal opportunities and ultimately are the gaps that we see um, in, 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 the, in, the, in the economy. Next. Next. So a few things, and I'll here talk more about policies around women's leadership and political participation and women's economic um, inclusion, which the, the labor force, which are things that I've been looking at more, and there, of course, are policies in different areas that we could look at, um, uh, in, in, of course, in, in many other areas of, of women's inclusion. But effective means for um, including women in political representation have been through quotas or affirmative policies in that sense or targets. Um, there are countries, there are quotas for women in politics um, in many, many countries around the world. Brazil has had an ele electoral quota um, for a few years now, mandating 30% of um, candidates on political parties and financing of resources that hasn't necessarily resulted, as you saw, in um, really uh, equality in seats. Um, more recently, uh, there have been some progress with establishing campaign financing to women. And this is really very recent, a new constitutional amendment. Um, this is a couple months ago, um, mandating that votes for women will count twice for the distribution of resources to party and elect electoral funds. Why does this matter? Um, partly the system in Brazil with the quotas, with electoral quotas for candidate parties, unless um, there are other mechanisms in place, such as determining that candidates um, are Kind of the zipper system, right? So that you have names on lists that alternate between men and women, or that there might be, for example, sanctions for not complying with the law. Um, these really are seems not to be super effective, and that's the case in Brazil, right? The other issue is even if women are on party lists and there's a mandate to have 30% of women on party lists, if they don't have funding to campaign and if they have no visibility it's unlikely that their campaigns or their candidacies will translate into actual voting and representation. So again, improvements that have, you know, Brazil has been trying to do, it's still not there. These are all very recent. Other countries have made a lot more progress by including all these mechanisms in laws and policies. Next slide. This is similar for the private sector, right? So similarly, many countries have been establishing targets and quotas for women's leadership on or participation on boards, right? So this has also been effective. Again, more affirmative policies around these areas for representation, both in politics and in the private sector. Um, so those have been the policies that uh, we've seen that have been working. Next. In terms of the wage gap, um, these are some examples of what has been done by other countries, um, and none of these exist in Brazil. And so these are just examples of what Brazil could do and have been looking into, actually. 
Um, so one is around equal pay for work of equal value. Brazil already has legislation around equal pay for equal work. Uh, it's very restrictive. And really the idea around work of equal value is that women's participation in jobs is often, there's often a lot of um, occupational segregation because of the types of jobs that women go into, but also the capacity that is awarded to them to go into specific functions. But the underlying premise behind promoting equal value is that the responsibilities they may have or the contribution they have to work into the workplace is of equal value to that of men's and other functions. And so a larger concept around inclusion and ensuring that the contribution that women are providing to the workplace is accounted for equally in terms of pay. Another uh, policy that has been adopted not just in Iceland, but in many other countries now is transparency around reporting. So it's not necessarily um, super effective to have legislation if there's no monitoring, right? And so many countries are now mandating um, reporting uh, by companies and mostly by private sector, um, reporting on discrepancies in, in wages. And that has shown to close the gaps in terms of women's pay and, and men's pay. Next. Other areas uh, that can be helpful to including it into the workforce. Uh, I mentioned some of these already, parental leave. So that's really um, in addition to providing adequate maternity leave, so allowing women to take time off to care for children and ensuring that men have paternity leave um, to do that. It's increasing the time and equalizing this time. And with that, promoting really more shared responsibility uh, for childcare, right? And that reduces inequality in many levels. So in many countries, and in Brazil, that's the case, um, women oftentimes get discriminated against in the hiring, right? Because employers don't necessarily want to hire women if they can hire men because of the costs of maternity leave and around maternity, right? So it's the time off work, it's actual costs, it's having to replace them. And so by promoting a more equal distribution of these responsibilities, especially with the leaves, that removes a lot of the stigma and the discrimination around hiring women because of its connection to uh, maternity and childcare, right? Similarly, childcare benefits um, and flex work are also policies that, um, of course, are conducive to allowing women to work. These are actually, I mean, in terms of in women's participation in, in employment and in the workforce, much of the, the barriers and the constraints really have to do with, um, with family responsibilities and parents of children. So a lot of the policies actually have to do around, have, have to do with that, right? So even with flex work, it's allowing women to be able to manage time and responsibilities both at home and at work and be able to manage their schedules so that they're able to, to work in an equal manner, right? Childcare benefits as well. So it's allowing women to have a place to, um, to care for the children or having that support so that they can work, right? And that was a lot of what the impact of COVID was, which was really not having that and really, you know, the time limitation around that. And then the recognition of unpaid care work, which, you know, as long as it is women who are doing this, the recognition and support around that um, could really enhance women's um, participation. Next. These are just some of the policies that uh, countries have adopted. This is quite recent and during COVID and, and really just you know what we celebrate or I celebrate when I see these things around the world. These are kind of good practices that uh, should and could be replicated. Uh, so in Spain, for example, paternity leave was extended to the same time as, as maternity leave. Um, this is going to be implemented progressively, but really um, you know, kind of going in the direction of what I mentioned, right? So really showing that men and women should have and can have equal responsibility and equal um, time to care for children and, and having an impact in, in women's in women's work. Um, in Argentina, uh, this was uh, kind of addressing the unpaid care work, right? So the recognition that unpaid care work is actual work and accounting for that in pension benefits, right? So really accounting for the time that women than taking care of children or uh, you know, doing work within the family as time that should be accounted for in pension um, or pension benefits, right? Next. 
Examples of child care leave policy. This was something that we monitored um, during COVID, and there was really a spike in government policies, laws, but also policies, right? Even kind of private sector company policies supporting child care during COVID. Again, with the great visibility around the impact that having children at home and out of school was having on women's capacity to work. Um, and so these are just some examples of what some countries around the world did during this period. Um, and many of these, if they weren't out there before, would be trapped, right? So really kind of a lot of progress in this area. Right. And I think this is mostly the end. So this is just looking at the gender gap for Brazil and the index score. This is again, the World Economic Forum um, between 2016 and 2021. And really showing that there hasn't been much of a progress. Um, so really, um, you know, the overall gap uh, in 2021 30% and really one of the worst among Latin American countries. Um, and, and this is the, you know, the latest report and even a, a drop this year. I mean, that was globally, but also for Brazil. Um, so just showing the urgency to you know, address these issues, to promote policies and to really make an effort um, to, to reduce these gaps. That's it, there's a last slide just to... And, uh, just so they we're willing to wait 135 years. This is the projected time. This is global, not Brazil. There is a protection for Brazil. But so that's my question always with some of these presentations and you know, what's our responsibility, each of us, in this to make the progress faster. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, anything else? Uh, I think it's pretty clear that there's a lot of work to do. And uh, before we get into our discussions, we would welcome Professor Camila Daniel. And uh, we uh, welcome your, your thoughts. Thanks, Camila. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sydney, for inviting me. And thank you, Paula, for the amazing presentation. And thank Brazil. The relation um, of gender inequality in Brazil and the world is always um, a great way to think about possibilities and to realize um, the steps that we have been moving forward, but also the steps that we still need to take. And as we were talking before coming here, um, I am an anthropologist and as an anthropologist, um, I think a lot and, oh. okay, now we got that before. Does that work? Okay. So I always, as a social cultural anthropologist, I always think and which extends the culture. And as you said, I have um, for many, for several times, uh, public policies may try to uh, make the gap uh, smaller, but the cultural norms, they still work and still pushing women behind um, and push them back. So I think one of the challenges that we can um, include how we can combine the production of ideologies and the change of structures at the same time, understanding that the, the material change may not happen in the same, well, the, the cultural change might not happen in the same pay, pace as the material change. And, and I think the examples of several women that are able to get into university, academia, or, or private companies, and still they are the ones doing the caring kind of jobs inside these areas. So many women, I, I can tell about academia, they are no better. Many women in academia, they, they are not able to achieve the higher levels because they are the one in charge of doing the jobs that several people don't wanna do. So this is very tricky. And also one major issue for me as um, also an anthropologist and black feminist is thinking about intersectionality, how important it is to include uh, intersectionality as a major uh, approach to think about public policies. Because at least in the case of Brazil, when we analyze data um, considering white men, white women, black men and black women, for most of the, the um, for most of the cases, black men, they are in, in lower positions than white, white women. And um, black women is in the bottom of pretty much all the, the 
um, conditions we take into an account. So I think it's really urgent include gender, but understand gender as being in dialogues with other layers of oppressions and power. So thank you very much, Paula, to give us this chance to think about Brazil and, and the globe and understand gender as, as a very fundamental standpoint to consider public policies. Okay, thanks so much. Oh, yes. Thank you. So before the Q&A, uh, there are a couple of uh, issues that I would like to bring to the discussion. And we're gonna do the same thing that, uh, same way that we did last time. We're gonna have a little bit of interaction here, then we're stopping the transmission. And then uh, the students will be able to ask questions and Paula will be able to also to address them more freely. Okay. Uh, Paula, what if there's one takeaway that I think we can get from, from your presentation is that in many ways, bridging the, the gender gap no, is a low hanging fruit, right? Because if you want to produce impact, like pretty much if you, if you improve the conditions of, uh, uh, of women, uh, automatically translate into, into uh, better, uh, better economic situation for those underserved groups. We recognize that, that uh, that has been an issue for a long time, but only recently, uh, gender policies have been at the forefront of the global policy agenda. So can you tell us a little bit about how, did, how, how that happened based on your experience and how we can see that moving forward? I mean, so I think, you know, part of it has been the lack of one visibility, even though the women's movement and the feminist movements have been around advocating for these issues. It wasn't on the agenda of government. Part of it is because governments have been and still are mostly dominated by men. And so it has been a lot of why and how priorities are established within government agendas, right? So that's been a big issue and a constraint historically, right? And I think more recently what's happened is not to say that you know the economic approach is the right one to take because I'm mostly a human rights lawyer from, from background, right? So I take the human rights angle in terms of why this is important, less so necessarily than the economic perspective, but bringing a lot of the evidence that I pulled up, which is relatively recent and showing the impacts to governments and having this very visible on, you know, Ministry of Finance's agendas because of the impacts, the economic impacts has been one driver, right? Another key driver has been really an international momentum around this issue, right? So it started back with the convention, but more recently it's been taken on by leading international organizations um, and leading international voices. And I think it's just become a social issue um, at the international level that has gained visibility that governments and the private sector as well, um, it's hard for them not to take into account. Right, it's just become a priority that's that's come to a point where um, it's hard to not see, right? And so this has been this has been driven, and I think part of it has been the understanding one of the impacts to all, but also a bit more of the understanding of what the constraints were, right? And so being able to also address the constraints more specifically, right? And so again, if we look at at the international level, I mean, I mentioned the World Development Report because it was definitely was worth it. There were other key, um, you know, analysis and evidence at the global level that even before that, of course, that uh, started driving this agenda. But I think, you know, multiple layers of, of constraints. Um, and now what I realize is from the work that, you know, there is a movement that is pretty pretty visible and it is a priority on, on the Earth's agenda. I think the constraint still is not necessarily the policy making, it is to some extent, but it is the underlying barriers that are still, you know, kind of the social and cultural barriers, right? You can change laws and policies, but that, as Camila said, doesn't necessarily translate into change unless a lot of additional work is done, right? 
busy changing mindsets, right? When you say, for example, and this is, I mean, I, I say this myself, and I think this is with unconscious bias in general, when you say you hadn't realized, right, the biases that you have, I think that's the case for all of us. And there's so much work around unconscious bias and the impact of kind of gender norms and social norms in how we all go about our lives and the decisions that are made, right? And that that's, I think, you know, the challenge still is what, what needs to be done to change that. And a lot of it has to do with awareness raising with education. And, you know, part of, you know, the, the, what I see is that sometimes it does take a generation to change some of these things because it takes mentality and, 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 and kind of upbringing within this new um, kind of mindset, right? Because we tend to replicate, we tend to accept as normal. There's one slide that I didn't put on here, but I usually do, which is, you know, you take a photo of, you know, these big meetings of G20, the, the latest in G7, and it's all men. And part of it, I mean, now we question this, but you know, a few years back, people would look at the photo and no one would even think what's wrong with this picture, right? And my slide was, what's wrong with this picture? Because I mean, even me, right? I mean, I wouldn't. And, and that's part of what goes into it is we don't realize that the biases are there and that the gaps are there unless we point them out. So that's, I think, the work that still needs to be done. Excellent. And I mentioned that uh, addressing the gender gap is a low hanging fruit if you want to use uh, social impact. Within the uh, gender policies, what are the low, low hanging fruits that you could identify that would produce most impact if we address them? I mean, I think, you know, from all the evidence more recently, especially with what we've seen with the impacts of COVID that have been so clearly showing that you know, the real bottleneck, I mean, when we're talking about, yeah, not gender equality generally, but with women's economic participation, it really has to do with support to childcare, right? And, 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 and responsibilities at home, right? I mean, that's, that's really been, I, I think from all the evidence that has come out, um, it's policies around that, right? So greater support for that. And I mean, you see that, in the U.S., I mean, just from a financial perspective, right? And 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 you see in the U.S., women, the cost of childcare is so high, right? So women with one children, with one child, they continue working, and it's a it's a huge cost. With the second child, oftentimes women stop working because it's financially unfeasible to continue working and pay for childcare for for two children, right? So things around that, um, because unfortunately, it is the women oftentimes who will be the workforce who will not be able to work because of, uh, and that's the case in Brazil for similar reasons, right? So I think policies around supporting women and families with children, distributing the burden of care, but government support to that, right? So with you know, social protection. Excellent. And my last point before we open up for questions from the students is that uh, Brazil has done a good job in closing the educational gap. Right. So in terms of literacy, in like two thirds, and one of the articles actually that was recommended to students by the World Bank showed that uh, two thirds of the graduates in, in Brazilian universities right now are women. Right? So that's pretty impressive. But as you said, like the, the labor, the gap in the labor market uh, remains there. Do you see some parallels between what's going on in Brazil and in the US? Is it on childcare or are there other issues involved in Brazil, particularly as well? Education um, uh, on the like, labor market is uh, uh, kind of child care that's also limiting opportunities, uh, job opportunities for women there in Brazil. You mean? In Brazil, yes. I mean, there, I think it's it's, it's <laughs> kind of a, a universal. Uh, I mean, when you look at all countries that we've looked at and, and looking at you know women's participation in in the job market, it's you know. I mean, in countries where you even have more more equality, right? It's women drop out when they have children, or women, you know, drop out for a few years and they come back. Um, and countries, for example, where you have either the parental leave, which you know, men contribute more to childcare, or they have you know, more protection, social protection around childcare, you see less of a drop of women in, in the labor market around. Um, so that, I mean, that's not the only thing, but that has really been a key issue. Yeah. Well, thanks so much, Paula. And with that, we've, uh, we are uh, finishing the public 
part of our class. So thanks so much for those of you who join us online. We're continuing the discussion here in the classroom with the students. Okay, Anna, we can stop the transmission now.